Welcome. This problem has to do with using a slingshot to deliver a packet of medical supplies from the ground to a position up on a cliff. Now the accurate delivery of projectiles has been an essential part of the profession of arms since its beginning, whether the delivery of an arrow to its target or when Alexander the Great used catapults to provide cover fire for his troops. The equations that govern the delivery of a medical packet up onto a cliff are the same equations that govern the delivery of any projectile to its intended target, whether for offensive, defensive, or humanitarian purposes. I'm Dr. Courtney. We know this is a projectile motion problem, so we're going to be using equations of motion. Because velocity is a vector quantity and we know the medical packet is launched at an angle, we need to use these equations in component form. Equations of motion are also known as kinematic equations. We want to find the launch speed, which we will denote as the magnitude of the initial velocity vector. And we are given the launch angle, theta, and distances, we'll use x for the horizontal distance and y for the vertical distance to the target. As we develop this problem, we'll make a physical sketch of what's happening and a point-by-point -point plan, which we'll then follow to evaluate it. So physically, we have someone on the ground launching this medical packet up to the recipient on the cliff. We have an initial launch angle, and then the packet will follow a parabolic trajectory. If the cliff were not there, it would continue on that trajectory to the ground. Now, this initial launch angle is what we are interested in, as well as the magnitude of the initial velocity associated with it. We are further given distances, so we have a vertical distance of 260 meters, and we have a horizontal distance of 380 meters. Let's take a closer look at that launch angle and the initial velocity. We are told that the angle of launch is 65 degrees with respect to the horizontal. So the horizontal component of the velocity, which we can call v naught x, will look like this, and the vertical component we can call v naught y. We'll establish relationships between the components and the initial uh, vector in a few moments. As we make a plan for evaluating the problem, a good first step is always to check units and convert into MKS units if we need to. Second, we want to express our positions, x and y, in terms of the other values, namely the initial velocity, acceleration, and time. Because we're dealing with vector quantities, we want to explicitly evaluate each vector quantity and write down components. So we want to either compute, and even if we don't need to compute them, and list all vector components. These will become our inputs. These will become our inputs to the equations of motion in component form. Okay, next. We can substitute into the equations from step two, and simplify, if that's possible, to some extent. Now, if you recall, the equations of motion have velocity, acceleration, time, initial positions in them when we're talking about the equations of motion for position. We were not given time in this problem, nor were we given the initial uh, velocity of launch. So these are two unknowns. So it's conceivable that when we substitute into the equations of motion in component form, we are going to have multiple equations and multiple unknowns. So our next step 
Not knowing what those equations look like ahead of time, we might not be sure of the best way to evaluate them. So in our next step, we're going to make a plan at least to decide whether to use substitution or elimination or some other method to simplify the equations of motion. And basically, uh, well, we want to isolate a single variable, t. Well, we want to isolate t and solve for t. Then we can choose an equation of motion to substitute our value for time into. Then we can calculate the initial launch speed. So this would be one of the equations of motion from step uh, four, because that's where we have the values. And finally, we want to consider how many significant figures we should use in reporting our final answer. As we evaluate the problem, we do a quick unit check and we see that our given values are in meters and the angle is in degrees, so we're fine. Secondly, we want to express the equations of motion in component form. So the x position is equal to the initial position plus the x component of the initial velocity times time plus one half the x component of acceleration times time squared. Similarly, for the vertical position, not that similarly. Okay, we start with the initial vertical position, the vertical component of initial velocity times time, the vertical component of acceleration times time squared. Now let's break down the vectors that we know into their components so we know what to substitute into these equations. First of all, if we go back to our system, back to our drawing, let's call this launch location 0, 0. That makes the mathematics easier and there's really no reason to use any other values. So we have x naught equals 0 and y naught equals 0. We're given the distances in this equation that we're trying to reach. The x distance was 380 meters. The y distance was 260 meters. Now let's discuss velocity. If we look at the relationship between the velocity vector and its components, we see that the x component of the initial velocity is expressed as the magnitude of the velocity vector, which is this, times the cosine of the angle between them. So cosine 65 degrees. Similarly, the y component of velocity is the magnitude of the initial velocity vector times the sine of 65 degrees because the vertical component is opposite the angle uh, under consideration. Now we need accelerations. What about the x component of acceleration? This is a projectile motion problem. So once the projectile is launched, the only force acting on it is the force due to gravity. That is a vertical acceleration in the uh, coordinate system that we have here. So there is no x component of acceleration. So that is zero. And in the y direction, it's all gravity. Now we've chosen in this system to have uh, up be the positive vertical direction. So gravity is acting toward the center of the Earth. So in this coordinate system, it's negative, minus 9.8 meters per second squared. So now we have developed or uh, broken down vectors into all the components that we need for our calculations. Next, let's begin substituting them into our equations of motion in the x direction first. So we have our x direction, 380 meters. This first one could get long before we simplify. So let's say step four here. We'll start with x way over here, which is 380 meters is equal to the initial x position, which was 0 meters, plus the initial velocity in the x direction, which was the magnitude 
oh, excuse me, of the velocity vector times the cosine of 65 degrees times time plus one half. The acceleration in the x direction was also zero times time squared. Now, I wrote out each term for completeness and so that I wouldn't forget one. I know that the temptation, and perhaps as you get more skilled, you will be able to just leave out these terms that you see are going to be zero. But I want to be complete here for us today. So we can simplify this. 380 meters equals the magnitude of the initial velocity times the cosine of 65 degrees times time. Let's call this equation 4a because we're going to use it later. Similarly, let's look at the y direction. So the y distance, which is 260 meters, is equal to the initial y position of 0 meters because we're starting from the ground, plus the magnitude of the initial velocity vector times the sine of 65 degrees times time Remember, this combination reflects the y component of the initial velocity. Plus 1 half negative 9.8 meters per second squared times time squared. Now, in this equation, only the initial position term is 0. So we'll end up with a longer statement, but we can simplify it a little bit. 260 meters equals the magnitude of the initial velocity times the sine 65 degrees t minus 4.9 meters per second squared times time squared. That might not be very readable. And let's fix up time here to make it clear that that's a t. Okay, let's call that equation 4b. Again, so we can refer to it later. All right, now we are at a decision point. Remember, as we realized we may end up with multiple equations and multiple unknowns, we realized we would have to decide how to resolve that in order to uh, get down to one variable that we could solve for first. So our choices include elimination, which would be subtracting a multiple of one equation from the other. In this case, since v naught and t are both unknowns, and they both appear in the same term, that approach is not going to be very fruitful. And, since this equation is rather simple, I would like to solve for t using this expression, no, I would like to solve for v naught using this expression, substitute into 4b so that v naught is eliminated. And then we will get one long equation with t as the only unknown. So let's do that. So from 4a, we are going to get an expression. If I divide through by cosine 65 degrees t, that's going to isolate the v naught. So we will have the launch speed is equal to 380 meters divided by cosine of 65 degrees times time. Now we will substitute that. So now I have a launch speed equals. So I'm going to substitute for the launch speed in equation 4b. So that gives us 260 meters equals. So here we go. I'm going to substitute this whole expression in for v naught. 380 meters over cosine 65 degrees times time times the sine of 65 degrees t and the rest remains the same minus 4.9 meters per second squared times time squared. Now let's simplify before solving for t. The t in the denominator here cancels with the t in the numerator and we recognize that sine of 65 over cosine of 65 is tangent 65 degrees. Now, if you evaluated each of these separately on your calculator already, that's not wrong. But the more times you push buttons on your calculator, the more opportunity there is for error. And so I like to simplify symbolically as much as possible before I turn on my calculator. 
So we have 260 meters equals 380 meters times the tangent of 65 degrees minus 4.9 meters per second squared times time squared. So this term now is just a number once we calculate the tangent of 65 degrees. My goal is to isolate time. We want to solve for time here. So what I would like to do is add 4.9 meters per second squared times time squared to both sides and then subtract 260 meters from both sides. So then we get 4.9 meters per second squared times time squared equals 380 meters times the tangent of 65 degrees minus the 260 meters. Now I turn on the calculator to find that this expression on the right simplifies to 554.91 meters. I'm still looking for t, right? So we'll divide through by 4.9 meters per second squared and that yields 113.248 seconds squared. Now why is that? Because when we divide meters by meters per second squared, let's do a little aside here. If we have meters divided by meters per second squared, then meters cancels and we're left with 1 over 1 over second squared. And if we multiply both numerator and denominator by second squared, we see that it is eliminated in the denominator and we are left just with the term of seconds squared. Now we can take the square root of both sides and we find that the time is 10.642 seconds. So it looks like we have an answer. Let's not lose sight of the goal. The goal was to find the initial launch speed. That was one of two variables that we did not know uh, when we developed our equations of motion. So now that we've solved for the, for the time that it takes, we can choose either equation 4a here or equation 4b here and substitute the time in order to compute the launch speed. I choose 4a because it's simpler. So we have, for step 6, using 4a, we have that, which we simplified up here, we have that the launch speed is equal to 380 meters over the cosine of 65 degrees and now we have that time 10.642 seconds. Simplifying we get that the launch speed is 84.491 meters per second. Now we need to consider how to report our answer. Checking back with the given values, we see that each of these has two significant figures. So we are going to report our answer also to two significant figures. So the launch speed is 84 meters per second. Well, we've done quite a bit of work already. So, so that we don't waste it, let's take a moment and consider whether or not our answer makes sense. First of all, we could check our units. It takes just a few extra seconds, but as we substituted values into our equations of motion, we included the units associated with each value. That protected us, for example, when we're substituting uh, into 4b and simplifying, we see that as we're looking to combine terms, each of these terms has units of meters. So meters minus meters we could do. If we had had meters minus meters per second squared, we would have made a mistake somewhere and the units would have given us a heads up. So in this case also, we were very careful. We did an aside to show that as we came down to isolating time, we did end up with the correct units associated with the number. Next, I said that you could choose between 4a and 4b to substitute the time into in order to compute the initial launch speed. 
Either one should yield the same answer if you've done your math correctly. So in order to double check, what you could do is quickly sub t into 4b. And what that looks like is um, 260 meters equals the 84.491, because we don't want to use our rounded value here, meters per second times the sine of 65 degrees times the time 10.642 seconds minus 4.9 meters per second squared times the time 10.642 meters per second squared. Oh, I'm sorry, seconds. All squared. And we get that 260 meters equals, we get 259.97, which rounds very nicely. So we find that our answer is consistent. So between unit analysis and using both equations to determine the initial launch speed, we have some confidence that our answer is correct.